this death, this destruction. Global news impacts us. And we have to change the way we live. This is why we need independent media. And with that being said, Lauren, you got to start for people. What is going on? Oh, so we all need our daily fix of caffeine. Yes, we do. Uh... Starbucks is a huge proponent of that, of course. Um, a lot of us do go to Starbucks mm -hmm. every day, um, sometimes more than once a day. Um, but they are starting to experience some very interesting internal meltdowns right now. All right, what's um, going on? Well, first of all, the CEO stepped down, so Schultz came back. He was... Um, He'd been the CEO for a while. He stepped down for a little bit to let somebody else do it. Um, and now we've got, uh, so now he's the interim CEO again. But in order to find someone to replace him, they are looking outside the company. Oh, so nothing will fundamentally change. Great job. Um, yes, yeah, so they're looking outside of the company for a new CEO. Um, and that's just interesting for several reasons. Number one being how many millions of dollars they spend on internal leadership training. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. They have to look outside the company. And he's saying it's because, you know, we are in a new era now and things need to change. They need to be shaken up in some way. And we can't do that from inside the company because we don't know how. Um, so they're looking at several different you know, things that they're going to have to be paying a lot of attention to. So part of the reason that he's going to have to step down anyway is unions, mm -hmm. um, the way that lots of stores are now um, unionizing. Uh, it's it's a new number every day. When I looked at it on, like, Wednesday, it was 122 stores have unionized, and then yesterday it was 200, like, voted to unionize. So it's it's happening quickly. Um, so that's that's one of the things that the... Uh, the new CEO is going to have to look into. They're they're worried about um, people changing how like their habits. Like how many are they going into the office? Are they not? Are they working in the store? Are they not doing that? So like they're trying to figure out how to adapt to that as well. Um, they're also looking to get into NFTs. Oh. Yeah. What? Hey, <laughs> let, let, let me test fate. What's the worst that could happen? Really? What can happen? Just. Hey, there you go. But NFTs. Hey, that, that makes yep, sense. Yep. Yep. Starbucks wants to get into NFTs, which I find, I mean, not surprising, especially because, you know, how, I, mean, well, I don't just, know. Just, just trust. You'll get a unique oh. image that will be worth something. All right. Will there it be go. worth something? You know. Will it be worth something? Y Will it be unique? Y y you know. You know. See, that's, that's a yes and a no. Will y it not you know. be hideous? Maybe, maybe it'll be a monkey smoking some weed. I don't know. <laughs> One of those things. Or maybe, yeah. a uh, maybe, maybe a monkey drinking a latte. There we go. Right? That, that's oh, worth something. Oh, gosh. That's that, worth that, that, yep. that something. No, it'll be like a mermaid or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be so <laughs> stupid. Like, so, Schultz, so Schultz is looking for outside help. Okay. essentially, in order to uh, start steering Starbucks in a new futuristic direction. Um, yeah. So he, and one again, one of the things that he is fighting against is the growing pressure to unionize. So um, there's 9,000 stores, um, and of those 9,000, now about 200 of them have officially voted to unionize. More are voting to unionize every single day. Um, like, they, you know, they just want, and Starbucks, in order to try and mitigate this, is like, well, we'll raise, you know, minimum wage for employees to $15 an hour by August. They're trying to, like, we'll give you a little bit. Don't unionize. Um, so Schultz, and this this is a quote from Schultz. He says, I am not an anti-union person. I am a pro-Starbucks, pro-partner, pro-Starbucks culture person. Mm. And we didn't get to where we are by having a union, which, I mean, I'm sorry, that sounds kind of culty to me. Yeah, it does. Plus, wasn't, didn't Starbucks start off as like a small business then bought yes. up by a corporation? There we go. Okay. That, so in other words, you have a CEO taking credit for something that he didn't even create. He wasn't around. He like So um, he... Also, 
decided to throw the, the Disney CEO under the bus after the whole don't say gay thing. He's okay. like, well, we, we need to be consistent and don't get political. So he's... That's the same idiot who ran a terrible campaign. No, screw that He's just tough. Yo, he definitely did that. So you know, Charleston has other, other CEOs under the bus making weird statements about unionizing. Um, also, there was a store in Ithaca, one of three stores, one of three Starbucks stores in Ithaca that um, voted to unionize and they're closing it now. Oh, Mm-hmm. Quinky dink. They're closing it. They're saying it was an issue with the facilities. Oh. Yeah, something's wrong with the facilities. Wink, which means, oh, we got to shut this thing down. Well, when, what the facility that they're having, like, so the, the workers at this particular store went on strike mm -hmm. um, for a couple of days because they were protesting the overflowing grease trap, which right. is the facility that they're blaming for now closing the store. Mm -hmm. um, now, I used to work next door to a Starbucks, and they had the grease trap guys come regularly to clean out the grease trap. Like, you, you can get that cleaned. It, it's part of owning the business, owning the store. You can get the grease traps cleaned. That's not a problem. Like, so to close your store and to cite that as the reason you're closing the store seems a little sus, especially because it is a smaller area. Um, it is a college town. So there's only about, like, there's only a few employees there over the summer, and then it balloons to about 30 during the school year, but it's only about 10 during the summer, so it's a small store. Um, it, you know, they, there's, they're figuring, it seems to me like they'd figure there's going to be very limited pushback. Oh. Well, you know, it's, it's not surprising that when a store or facility, let's say an Amazon warehouse facility, decides to unionize, then all of a sudden, oh no, we got to push back, we got to stop it, there's something wrong with this, oh, we got to challenge the vote, mm -hmm. there's something weird going on here. It's what we see time and time again when unions actually win. Yeah. So... But don't tell Jane Uber. I, I'm not ever likely to talk to him. <laughs> um, the... The other, the other issue, the other way that Starbucks is trying to push back against people unionizing, and this kind of, um, is they are threatening other benefits. You know, not necessarily outright, but they're suggesting, they're pulling their people aside, they're having their managers pull their people aside and be like, well, you know, and this is one that came up several times. That's why I'm going to mention this. I know that you are using our um, our gender affirming and trans healthcare benefits. Those might go away if you unionize. Like they're using that specifically to try and get people to be afraid to unionize because then they'll lose their healthcare that gets them access to like hormone therapy and things like that. So. It's like, so they're, they're using that against their, their workers to try and make sure it's like, well, you know, you know, we give you health care and we give you all of this and this and this. You, you might lose some of those in negotiations. <sighs> Man, these corporations are insidious. They, <laughs> they know how to scare people, intimidate people. Don't let the corporations intimidate you because at the end of the day, you're just a number to them. Yeah. They don't like you. They don't respect you. They don't think about you. You're not valued to a corporation. No. And in that same vein, um, it's not just Starbucks doing this. It's it's people across the board, companies mm -hmm. across the board, just essentially begging their workers that can work in the office to come back to the office. But just begging them. Like okay. Schultz, Schultz, to be like to continue in the Starbucks, uh, Schultz says, I will beg on my knees. I will do push-ups. You know, he says he's in the office seven to seven every day to try and, you know, give people a, uh, like, to give them a role model. Um, unlike Elon Musk, he has not offered any ultimatums because Musk, if you don't know this, recently said that if you don't come back to the office for 40 hours a week, you can leave the company. Well, this is what happens when you have corporations run America and not to mention by our politicians. So... Yeah. All, all this stuff that politicians care, they're going to somehow stand up to these CEOs. Right. That ain't going to happen. This is America. We're an oligarchy. We're all, our politicians have prostituted themselves to the corporations, and no disrespect to prostitutes for comparing them to politicians. So, yeah. So they want their workers to come back to the office. They're blaming productivity. They're saying, well, we don't know, but actually profits, profits are up. 
mostly across the board. So it's not like productivity is going down because people are working from home. Um, there's some interesting like psychology behind it where the thought is that uh, as human beings, we like to have some kind of semblance of control and a CEO or a boss feels like they have more control if they can see the people that they're in charge of and have a lot more direct contact into their lives. That is how they feel like they have control. And when people are away from the office, um, they don't have that. And they'll try and say like, oh, well, it's not as creative without the, the people all together and like socializing and getting together and coming up with ideas as a group. But it's like, okay, but the other problem with that, the other side is so many times we end up in just like a fishbowl think tank. Like you don't get new ideas because you're just repeating the same things over and over. So it's not actually more like more creative, like more creativity inducing to like be in the office. It's just not. Um, so it's the, the, I like the, I think it is, it does make sense that the idea that they want to make sure that they have that control. And Schultz is like, oh, I'm just old fashioned. And a lot of CEOs are saying the same thing. I'm just old fashioned. Um, so I want people in the office. Um, we do have a, a video that sort of um, talks a little bit more about, about that. Now to discuss what that means ahead of tomorrow's job report is Recruiter.com CEO Evan Sohn. Evan, this doesn't kind of at first blush make sense to me. Recruiters aren't feeling so hot, but they're, they're paying more. But higher pay isn't making prospective employees feel so hot. Like, wh why, are, why are we so picky and why are we so vexed? Yeah, look, thanks, John, for having me uh, having me back. And uh, are we surprised that it's not easy? Uh, <laughs> nothing's been easy this, this entire time. You know, we started to use the expression from our talent effectiveness team called the great reevaluation. And we think companies are really, and employees are really reevaluating when they want to go back, how they want to go back, how should they get paid, et cetera. And it's making the recruiter's job even more difficult. And that's why we saw recruiter sentiment down uh, out of five. Last month, it was at 3.9. It's down to 3.6. And the candidate sentiment went down from 3.5 last month to 3.3. It's hard. And, you know, the, the companies are trying. Uh, we saw 37 percent of the record, recruiters reported an increase in salaries. Yet on the candidate side, that dropped as a priority. So compensation as a priority dropped from 30 percent to 25 percent. So let me explain what that means. That means that of the candidates' priorities, 75 percent of their priorities, their number one priority was not about compensation. Then what was work -life it? Balance, Work-life balance, remote work. Uh, new experiences went up from 14% to 20%. You know what so this sounds to me like, though, Evan? I mean, it, are we experiencing in the job yes. market uh, an inflation of expectations, similar to the monetary right inflation that we're experiencing? I mean, it, does it seem like the market's so tight that candidates are kind of like, oh, well, I kind of don't want to work today, or I want to work in my slippers, or, you know, what, what do I want out of life as opposed to just money? Where if times were a little tougher and things were a little tighter, maybe those concerns wouldn't be the same? I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, the, the question no one's asking is, where's all this money going? How are people actually living? Uh, and maybe this is a big impact of the gig economy as people are using side hustles as their as their primary hustle, uh, as their primary uh, as their primary income. It's getting harder. And what we saw in the numbers is that more companies were using recruiters to go after the forty to thousand dollar salary positions. And if you watched our numbers back in August, about twenty two percent of the recruiters reported that those roles were in that salary range. Mm. That's now over thirty four percent. So all of a sudden now you're having recruiters, which ordinarily didn't recruit in those levels, are now you're, you're having companies say, hey, recruiters, get me those people. That's what's hard to do. But now, there's also, th there's, a, there's a problem recruiting recruiters, right? Oh my gosh, you know, uh, earlier this week, Wall Street Journal came up with an article that said the hardest thing to recruit for uh, is recruiters. You know, demand is right, surging wait, 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 for wait, wait, recruiters. Can you pause here for a second? Because uh, here's, here's what I want to bring up. Look, right now, Americans are tired of the regular game. They're tired of the dog and pony show. They're tired of the character stick. You got to contribute, contribute to a system that doesn't give a damn about you. You know, and not to mention, let's look at those job fairs that always came up as well, where you had those same recruiters. You know what they tell you at those job fairs? Well, you can't apply here. You got to apply online. Those job fairs are the biggest scam ever in American history. Yeah. Just, just, just had to throw that out there. Yeah, it, no, that's, yeah, right. Yeah, so there we go.
All right. Um, the, well, your, your final notes of the story. The, the final notes of the story are people are trying, like, the CEOs are attempting to continue to exert an insane amount of control over the people that they work for, and they're continuing to exploit those workers. And when workers try to avoid that, or they try to change that, or they're trying to change their situation, they are being manipulated, they're being gaslit, they are being threatened, Mm -hmm. um, and it's all being done just right out in the open and with a smile on the faces of the CEOs involved, and it is disgusting. And of course, corporate media and the two-party system will defend those rat bastard CEOs as as average Americans lose their homes, their small businesses, their livelihoods, and so much more. Now more than ever, look, I'm all for union workers, but we also need to start looking into worker co-ops and breaking away from this two-party system. More and fantastic work reporting the story. Keep them doing great stuff. There you go. There we go.